Hey everybody, it's Dylan here. Before we get into the show, I just wanted to apologize for this episode going up a little later than usual. I definitely was aiming to have it up at our normal date and time, but uh, we in America this weekend were celebrating one of our holidays, uh, Memorial Day, which is based on our national pastime of war. Uh, and I don't know, I just ended up spending time with family and didn't get around to the edit. And you know what? I don't regret it. It was nice to see people who I don't spend that much time with. I recommend it. Pick up the phone and call your roots. Unless all of those people are, whatever, psychic vampires who want to eat your soul, who you have fought hard to extricate yourself from, in which case, keep on doing you. Keep on doing you. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention before we get into the show was that our Discord server has been awesome. It is popping off. So go to discord.me slash monkeys with a Z uh, because we've really enjoyed over the last week kind of getting to know you guys uh, on a more personal level and arguing about dumb stuff and gorilla stuff and uh, uh, making friends. So yeah, come join the party. Lots of fun. All right, let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to Hallelujah Monkeys for May 29th. My name is Dylan Flynn. My name is Trevor Ickrath. Trevor, everything about this is wrong. Right, you're in some kind of uh, alternate conditions right now, right? <laughs> yeah, everything about it is wrong. I'm My posture is wrong because I'm sitting on a bed instead of in a chair. Uh, I'm in the wrong state. I'm in Kentucky instead of Texas. That's why you sound so different. I, well, yeah, my drawl has changed. It's right. a bit more northern now. Uh, and I'm not alone. I'm in my. I'm in a room right now with my wife and my dog. And I'm already starting to get the vibes of being like an abusive spouse who doesn't let their significant other speak when they're hanging out with their friends. Does that technically make this the first live episode of Hallelujah Monkeys? Because because one half of the episode can be heard by yeah, another human live being. Live in studio. Yeah. Live in studio. Hang on. I'm gonna I'm gonna invite my significant other onto Mike just so that I don't feel like a piece of shit. Okay. All right, you're you're shifting up the dynamic here, but okay. Okay. Uh, hi, Shelly. Welcome to Hallelujah Monkeys. Hi. Hi, Shelly. Uh, I understand that on the way up to Kentucky, you heard the new Gorillaz album for the first time. Why don't you tell the people at home honestly what you thought about it? <laughs> I liked the first song. <laughs> <laughs> you liked Ascension. Oh, I thought she meant I turned my robot on. She, oh, you thought she meant the intro. No, she liked yeah. Ascension. What did you think about every song other than that? I liked the one with the guy with the poodle. Oh, yeah. She liked when she looked down at the playlist and saw that Drom was credited on a song. Okay. Her reaction to that was, oh, this has the guy with the poodle on it. <laughs> 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 well, Shelly, thank you for joining us on Hallelujah Monkeys. Yeah, I'm a valuable guest on your show. Great having you on. Come back anytime. Gorilla's super fan, Shelly Flynn, giving her two cents about humans. Not a fan. Uh, Trevor, before we get into the show proper, I wanted to announce that we're going to do a, a new thing, something we've never tried before. Yeah, why don't you tell everybody about that? Okay, so we're going to show our hand a little bit. But uh, we have we have this episode and one other episode after it, and after that... We're going to do like our power rankings where Trevor and I are going to list our 10 favorite Gorillaz songs, and we're also going to rank the main seven Gorillaz albums in order. That's going to get bloody. It is going to get bloody, but it also might be a little, I think if you're listening at home, you probably have a, and you've listened to every episode, you probably have a pretty decent idea of what our album rankings are going to sound like, you know? Plus, there's only like really one correct ranking, and I assume we're both there, so (laughs) super fans that we are. Uh so what we wanted to do is have a third uh, ranking on that episode, and that's sort of an... We want to ask you guys, we want to do a poll, basically, right? Right. So what we're going to have you do is, if you're listening, we'd like you to email us. That address is hallelujah monkeys with a Z at gmail.com, and then rank uh, the seven main Gorillaz albums. I mean, all the regular ones. No Leica. So why don't we, why don't we walk through those? There's the self-titled... There's G sides. There's right. Demon Days. Yes. D sides. Yes. Plastic Beach. Correct. The Fall. Yes. And Humans. That's all of them. Rank them in order from favorite to least favorite, and then type out in order of favorite to still favorite, but not as much favorite. Your ten 
favorite gorilla songs. Now, if you want to do some Thai places in there, that's well, not like Thai restaurants, but if you want two songs to tie with each other, that's fine. But any songs you list after 10, we're not counting them for points. That's how it works. Uh, and then we're going to add up, we're going to crunch all the numbers, and then I think what's going to happen is we'll do our list, and then the grand finale, we're going to find out what is the average Hallelujah Monkeys listener think. The consensus among the Hallelujah Monkeys fan base. Yeah, so get those in. Uh, you have until June 12th, that's the deadline. We need your rankings by June 12th to be included in the, in the final tally. Uh, you want to go to the news? Yeah, let's get into the news. It's all good. It's been, a, it's been a pretty busy week. We have three very interesting stories to talk about this week. Yeah, I'm pretty hype about one of them in particular. Can we start off by talking about the possible leaked set list for the Demon Days warm-up gigs? We definitely can. Um, the source of this I want to be a little cagey about because it does appear to be somebody who is officially linked to the live gorillas. I don't know, performance uh, in some capacity. And while I don't think calling that person out on our podcast will will push her over or under the line of being in trouble for doing this. Right. I just don't want to, you know, you you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the information is out there if people want to go find it. For sure. And it's so based on that, I'm going to go ahead and lean towards this being legit. Um, but anyway, as of the 25th of May, this is a, a picture that this person took of a set list and posted on Snapchat. And at the top of it, it says... Not a final fucking set list. Twenty five five seventeen. So I'm going to guess that this is for like maybe the warm up gigs and also Demon Days, but it's not right. Nothing set in stone here. Mm -hmm. Rather than going through every single song on this, the broad strokes of it are: it's got all, everything from humans except for Hallelujah Money. It would have been really cool to see that in a live setting. I know, good. even if they did just have uh, Benjamin Clementine like on a screen. I would love to see Benjamin Clementine on a screen because we've already yeah. seen in the Hallelujah Money video that he It looks like. sick as hell, yeah. Let's talk about what we do have from Plastic Beach. Because there are only three songs here from Plastic Beach. Rhinestone Eyes and Stylo and... And Glitter Freeze. <laughs> David loves that song, dude. It's still here. It won't go away. I have a theory. I have a theory about Glitter Freeze, dude. So I think Glitter Freeze was named after the musician slash convicted uh, sexual criminal... Gary Glitter. Gary Glitter. Yeah. And his, it uses the same beat as his very famous song, Rock, Rock and, and Roll, Roll Part, Part two. 2. You've heard it at every sporting event you've ever been to. Da -na 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 -na. Hey! You know that one. I have this weird theory, Trevor, that maybe Damon secretly still believes that Glitter Freeze is going to become a stadium event staple if he just keeps playing it live <laughs> i will tell you it kind of kicks ass live like admittedly it's oh, yeah. pretty it's pretty kind of brings the house down there's yeah. a really great one version of it on that glastonbury show that yep. was uh the live one and then even the version on the itunes session i think is kind of cool but i think we can both agree that if Damon is only going to play three songs from Plastic Beach, <laughs> it's a it's Glitter weird. Free should not be one of them. On Melancholy Hill, how about how about the most popular song from the album? Do you think that he doesn't like that song in particular anymore? He already has the bell there to do the outro. He has the bell. He has, the bell is right there, Damon. Just play on <laughs> Melancholy Hill. It's not happening. It might happen. Maybe somebody will talk him into it. But they're okay. Let's talk about the two really interesting things that we're getting that we probably didn't expect to get. You mean the two things close to the end of the main set? Yeah. Well, uh, they, I don't know if if we didn't expect to get is the right word. I didn't. I didn't. Okay. So it's well known that one of the featured acts on the Demon Days Festival in Margate is a, a UK rapper named Little Sims, who we know is a gorilla's collaborator, but her song has not come out yet. Right. It's going to be on the super deluxe vinyl edition of the album. Correct. And her song is called Garage Palace. Or Garage Palace. Or Garage Palace. Yeah, I guess right. considering the, the personnel involved, it's probably Garage Palace. But mm -hmm. that is on the Demon Day set list. So we're getting a premiere of a track, unless it leaks before then. Uh, we're getting the official premiere of, of a new Gorilla song live at Demon Days Festival. Worth mentioning, worth reminding you, if you're listening, that this whole festival is being streamed thanks to our 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 alt right brethren at Red Bull. <laughs> and when is that happening? June 10th. <laughs> I didn't want to look it up, but I'm pretty sure that's right. 
Hail Gorillas. <laughs> anyway, that's not the only really cool thing we're getting. I'm oh, even man. more psyched about this. Out of Body is on the set list. Dude, do you think that this is? Do you think Out of Body is going to be just for this festival, or is that going to be in the mix? I don't know. I would really tour. love to see it live. I can't imagine how much fun that would be. Super cool. Uh, Trevor. Dylan. Did you know that Gorillas has a lot of friends who are not people but companies? Yeah, they do seem to be pretty. <laughs> they do like rubbing shoulders with the uh, with big money. <laughs> it's true. It seems like every day there's a new sponsorship. Most recently, they've announced a partnership with a German energy company called Eon. But they the 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 big coming out party for this partnership, Trevor, was that we technically have another music video. Yeah, uh, for We Got the Power, which uh, proves uh, both of us from a week ago wrong. I know we weren't expecting to see a new video for any of those four songs. Do you think this is the music video that Noodle uh, referenced them starting no. work on? No, I don't. Yeah, me neither. This was a fun treat to get. If you haven't seen it, uh, so it's like a they took a bunch of figurines of like... They had these little automated toys. Yeah, like a bunch of toys kind of doing, doing stuff. Almost like you're riding through It's a Small World, you know? like barely. Yeah, like a big synchronized dance with all these little electronic toys. And then at the end, uh, the band shows up, Gorilla shows up, and, they're, and it's mostly Phase 2 figures, right? And then... Yeah, those uh, kid, kid Robot made those toys, right? Yeah, but it's a cute music video, and you know what? A renewable energy campaign feels better to me yeah this is something i definitely don't mind them getting behind i mean it's way better than like red then bull gorillas have partnered up with halliburton and, and jamie hewlett is designing a custom tank missile <laughs> this at least feels a little bit more on brand with the kind of yeah you know very in character for damon as well he cares a lot about the environment so there's more to it um the other part of their partnership is that they're, the band announced that they're planning to record new songs in a studio that is powered by uh, solar power. Yeah, that should be pretty cool. I wonder if we'll actually see anything from that. So they're called Kong Solar Studio. Let me, let me read you this quote, Trevor, and then let's do a little bit of speculating, okay? All right, let me hear it. Here's directly from the press release. The studio will be unveiled at the Gorillas Demon Days Festival in Margate next month before setting off on the world tour for the band's new critically acclaimed Humans album. So this sounds like it's going to be some kind of an installation that's going to be available at Live Gorillas dates. Is that is that what you're getting from this? Yeah, it does kind of sound like that, doesn't it? I also wonder, like, if it's legit, could this be setting us up for getting, like, a, a spiritual successor to The Fall? The Fall Part 2 solar-powered boogaloo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are we going to get... But I would actually really like it if this became a tradition, you know? That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, a little bonus content at the end of every phase. That'd be awesome, you know? The, especially especially because we don't have to deal with uh, uh, the idea of The Fall being the final Gorillaz album anymore, you know? Right, yeah, that would have been... That's an interesting alternate timeline. The only other thing I wanted to mention from that uh, <laughs> Eon press release was a... a Great Murdoch Nichols quote in which he prefaced right. his little statement by saying, I'm not just a feminist, I'm an environmentalist too. <laughs> yeah, Murdoch, he's pretty woke this phase. He's pretty woke. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, he's become a regular SJW. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get into the main story. Oh, yeah, let's talk about these uh, new bonus tracks we got from the Japanese edition. Yes, here's another tricky situation where I, I really would love to credit somebody for getting these songs to us but i don't want to get them in trouble i'm just gonna say thank you to our special benefactors from the great white north and the far east <laughs> for hooking us up uh with these amazing tracks uh or are they let's talk about them i didn't think they were anything special despite the names they were kind of just they were kind of little like what the fuck curiosities which i guess this is a great time to talk about them because that this is the episode for it that's true okay so let's right. let's start with the busted in blue fire Yunnan special okay it was neither of these were what i was expecting me neither really i was kind of expecting extended versions of the the album versions with like new feature verses on them but there were a couple of differences on the arrangement of the of the busted in blue one i think i heard a couple of like swells some synthy swells that aren't in the album version the main difference is that you've only got faya yunan doing her lead vocal in arabic no damon on this track am i wrong did i miss him i don't think damon was on it no i didn't hear him i think she fit over this chord progression better than i was expecting yeah i thought it was i, I don't know i thought it was pretty nice but at the same time this song just kind of feels there yeah 
was there were there serious conversations about whether or not to use this on an album version, do you think? See, that's a good question. I think that's the question here. I was wondering if these were going to be like alternate options for Damon to put on the album or just kind of maybe tracks he made out of the parts that didn't end up going into the final one. I would like to see a translation of Faya Yunan's uh, Arabic lyrics because I would like to know, is this the Latin Simone to Latin Simone English? I was wondering about that too. Yeah. Is it, is she just singing the same thing or is she answering Damon's version? If any of our listeners like, uh, Oh yeah, we've got some listeners in the, in the Middle East, according to my metrics. So yeah, if you, if you want to translate these Faya Yunan lyrics. But, uh, the drum, the drum thing, I think, uh, is an even better case of this, like not being clearly like an option that Damon decided not to go with and being more of like a remix he put together. So this really does, after, that's what I, I wrote down. Doesn't this sound like a, like one of your standard humans remixes? I just mean the, the the synth and the beat is totally different than the than the album version of Andromeda. I believe that the humans team is responsible for this song. I don't think it was any outside help, but it really gave me like a one of these banks and ranks or outside uh, musician vibes. Like it felt yeah. like a remix to me, you know. I think probably what uh, I know I was expecting, and you, I imagine you might have been too, was uh, this was just going to be like Andromeda the song with a little guest verse bridge for a drum or something like that and instead what we basically get is the same drum verse kind of over and over and over and yeah over. something that feels like would fit into the song is a bridge like that but just is kind of copy pasted throughout the song I, I don't know it didn't really do anything for me well i did like that i did like the synth solo on the outro yeah that was cool yeah i just that i don't almost know felt I thought, like do you think that almost felt like maybe an element that was potentially in play for the album version at one point that they put on this version you know possibly i don't know the more like everything i've heard about andromeda just makes me feel like the final version that damon went with is the best version of the song that could have been so well and speaking of why isn't drums bridge from the album version on this version who knows man seems like if you're, if you're making a dramified version of andrama uh, andromeda then wouldn't you just use all of your drum? Anyway. I got, I don't know. I guess it's just a home for all the th- stuff that he didn't use. It, it's a curiosity. It definitely also gives us a better picture of what we can expect from the other alternate versions on the upcoming Super Deluxe that are marked as blank special, you know? Yep. It, we're so grateful to the the friend of the podcast who helped us get our, our greasy little fingers on those uh, alternate tracks. And then should we just get into the round table? Yeah, let's uh, get into these rarities that we're going to be talking about. Trevor, today's episode is going to take some context to explain yeah, exactly it's, what it's we're a doing. little different than what we're usually doing because we've kind of run out of actual proper releases to talk about. We're we're breaking up all of the either uh, collaborator focused or non-album focused gorilla songs that we have not yet gotten to on this episode there's too many for one episode and there's not quite enough for three episodes right of course perfect so then we were kind of looking into well how do we how do we split these if we split it down the middle and we just like end in the middle of phase two that's gonna feel weird Right? Yeah, that would not. I would. That would drive me insane. So we decided to do something much easier, and we've built a giant wheel, like the one that exists on the prices, right? Yeah, or the Wheel of Fortune, or something. Right. Except for you know, Wheel of Fortune is is uh, horizontal, and Prices Right is vertical, and ours is diagonal. Yeah, we we kind of ran out of parts to build it halfway through, so it's got a little bit of a tilt to it. It looks very dangerous, actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what we're gonna do? We have thirty songs to get through, so we're gonna do fifteen today, and we're gonna we're just gonna listen to the ones we're gonna discuss the ones whatever the wheel lands on are the ones that we discuss. All right. Right, and this week I will be spinning the wheel and you will be announcing the names of the songs. Is that correct? No. Um, is that right? Is that what we're doing? Okay. I think so. Okay, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Did you want to spin? You can spin the wheel first. You really want to spin the wheel first, don't you? You know what? No. I'm going to be a bigger man. You're going to spin this week and I'm going to announce, all right? All right. All so, right, let's do it. So what's going to happen is, I don't think we need to say anything else. It's not like we have to talk about when, we'll talk about when these songs came out as we get to them. Okay, uh, when you're ready, spin that wheel. All right. <laughs> Uh, and the first rarity is Pirate's Progress. Okay, pretty good place to start because uh, it's kind of based on the, kind of served as the intro to Plastic Beach. 
That's true, or did it? Okay, so this was released uh, in March of 2010 on the iTunes Deluxe and Japanese editions of Plastic Beach. And if you've never heard Pirate's Progress, you've heard some of it probably, because it was sort of edited down into the orchestral intro of Plastic Beach. But the album itself segues into Pirate Jet, which is weird. Yeah, it has that little dinging bell that kind of goes into it, right? So... Do you think that at some point, like, was there a version of Plastic Beach at, in play at some point that had this full song into Pirate Jet? You mean in between um, Cloud of a Knowing and Pirate Jet as well? Like, Yeah, I guess. I guess that's where you put it, unless Pirate Jet was somewhere else on the album. Honestly, I think that would work pretty well, having a little uh, extended uh, reprise of the intro right before we get the uh, final song on Plastic Beach. And Cloud of Unknowing kind of ends with that that. Symphony of Eva Sting, so it would make yeah, sense. Yeah, it, so. it would make for a really good transition. Interesting, interesting. I should yeah. have I should have tried mm-hmm. it, it sequenced in with the album this week to see how I like that, but I didn't do that. Like uh, I think we touched on during our Plastic Beach episode, this is just kind of like a really beautifully composed song. This is all Damon, right? It, yeah, no other credited arrangers or composers on this song. Just every member of Symphony of Eva gets their credit, obviously. I, you know what this really feels to me? It's it feels very directly like kind of Gershwin inspired like once you get oh totally once you get clear of the of the bit that we know from the orchestral intro it really gets into this kind of like there's clarinets and it's kind of blending that whole jazz and and classical thing that like songs like Rhapsody in Blue I'm not necessarily a classical music I could almost see this getting its own kind of like a sequence in like uh Disney's Fantasia movies for sure and I yeah just just Fair warning. I'm not. I'm not like a connoisseur of, of orchestral music. So, to an extent, I guess I'm talking out of my ass here. But to my ears, this sounds really confident to me. You know? Yeah. This sounds like a pretty rich, confident, intelligent composition for for full orchestra. I'd honestly be interested in hearing an entire album worth of Damon orchestral arrangements. Yeah, and I think that, you know, obviously he'd already done Monkey, Journey to the West by this point, so he'd worked in the opera. I don't know, man. This is really beautiful. I think uh, it's a really rewarding listen. It it stands alone. Like, it doesn't feel like a curiosity. It feels quite, you know, fleshed out. It feels like a real... Yeah, I like it a lot. A very finished piece. So, do you want to get on to the next song? I'm going to spin the wheel. Oh, shit. All right, here we go. Here we go. The next uh, rarity is Small Time Shot Away. By massive, massive Attack, Attack collaboration, yeah. Featuring 2D. This is from, what, 2006, right? Their album 100th Window? Uh, 100th Window is earlier than that, my friend. Uh, 2003. 2003. Yeah, 2003. 2003. Okay. Um, uh, the 2D vocals on this track are notoriously hard to hear. There is actually... I don't, I don't really think he's there. They, well, he's credited, so what can what can we do, right? Playing keyboards, dude. Playing keyboards. But there's a but there's a, a version of this song that came out much later um, on a on the band's uh, collected yeah a compilation album. That version called Small Time Shoot 'Em Up, and it's on um, the uh, deluxe edition. I think the bonus tracks. You can hear Damon a lot better on that version, but yeah, he's pretty clearly on that one. Yeah, but he's not credited as 2D on that one. He's credited as Damon Albarn. So interesting. I didn't notice that. Yeah. So that's why we're talking about this version and not that version. So 2D plays keyboards and Damon sings on it. <laughs> I guess that's true. Sure, why not? Yeah, cracked it. Uh, I don't know about the song. I think it's cool. Do you like Massive Attack? Are you a big fan of them? I'm not a big fan of them, but I I like mean, Massive Attack a lot, actually. I, yeah, I think there's a couple pretty... of their albums I, I quite like. I actually really think that this whole album, 100th Window, is boring. And then I think that the song's kind of boring. Yeah, this is probably at the bottom of my, of my Massive Attack power rankings, but their other stuff is really good, and I would definitely recommend them to uh, Gorillaz fans. They seem like an act that would be right up those people's alley. This song's like seven minutes long, you know? Yeah, it doesn't need to. I can. It definitely doesn't need to be that long. You feel every second of it for sure. <laughs> yeah, but it's effective. I mean, you know, it's, it's it does it. It barely skates by doing the thing you kind of want from a Massive Attack album. It, it puts you. It like sets a vibe. You know, it's nice and atmospheric. Why do you suppose it is? Because I've been thinking about this. Why do you suppose it is that Two D is featured in two thousand three, and then in two thousand and six, Damon is featured. Other than the keyboard and vocals theory, I have no idea. Okay, here are two theories that I came up with. Okay. One, compilation albums are a lot of time overseen by labels and not artists. Right, that's true. So it's possible that some some goofball at wherever, uh, EMI or wherever, was looking at this thing as 2D what? I don't understand. And just put Damon's <laughs> name on it. Yeah. The other option is, what if maybe in 2002, 2003... 
Damon was kind of excited by the idea of having his work credit as 2D. Maybe in 2005, 2006, he was a little less excited about that. Yeah, maybe he wanted to just kind of step out of the spotlight uh, earlier. Yeah, and maybe maybe it seemed a little sillier to him a few years later. Or that they just thought it would be a good joke, because 2D is kind of based on um, one of the guys from Massive Attack's name. 3D. 3D. Right. Yeah. And, hey, to be fair, it is a hilarious joke. <laughs> it's pretty fucking funny. <laughs> All right, the studio audience is waiting, Trevor. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this big old wheel a spin again. And the next rarity is... Dub Dum. Dub Dum. This is one of my favorites of the bunch. Okay, so this was released in May 2001 as a pack-in song in the uh, video game MTV Music Generator 2. And I gotta say, in preparation for this episode, I hunted down a copy and gave this game a try. Did you really? No, no. Oh, I was so excited. I actually owned MTV Music Generator 1 for the PlayStation 1. Um, what, what? Explain this game to me. Think like the m- simplest version 1.0 of GarageBand possible. Interesting. I was expecting something more like uh, Guitar Hero. No, it's got like, it's a sequencer. You can you can write little mini melodies in it and it's got loops and stuff. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and then the version of Dub Dumb in that game, you get access to all the stems as loops. So you get the drums right. and the, the instrumentation and the different vocals uh, to kind of play with. Uh, what do you think about the song? I think it's pretty cool. I think maybe it could be uh, rearranged a little bit because parts of it feel a little copy-pasted. But other than that, like there's a lot of cool elements going on here. I really like Damon's uh, kind of wordless vocals, that little humming he does. I love the bass line, of course. Is that Junior Dan? Yeah, that's all. That's Junior Dan. Uh, and of course, it's got a big feature from Sweetie Irie on it. Who doesn't come in until much later in the song, actually. Yeah, he shows up later doing some what is called skanking. What do you think of the skank part of this song? I like it. I think he fits over it nicely. Um, I, th- I would actually rather, I would. I feel like I would prefer a different kind of rapping over this one. I'm a really big fan of like, I'm a big fan of pato- uh, patois rap and like skank to a lesser degree, but I don't know. I would like to hear something a little more melodic on this one, I think. I like when he goes, Ugh. I don't like that part. And I don't like the really shitty way they kind of loop it before he gets faded out. Oh, yeah, they, like, do a little echo of the... <clears throat> yeah, it just doesn't work for me that way. Are well. you kind of familiar, Trevor, with uh, machine learning in the uh, area of music composition? No, I'm not. So Google, of course, has been spending, like, billions of dollars trying to teach computers to do uh, more complicated tasks by learning from repetition. Um, Great. That's not scary at all. And one of the areas they're looking into is music composition, and they're and they've gotten like really sophisticated versions of the software where you can like give it all of the Bach compositions that have ever existed, and then say write something like this, and it'll spit out something that sounds a little bit like Bach. Mm-hmm. This almost sounds like you did that with Gorillas. Like this sounds a little bit, yeah. Like the most pure distillation of that Phase One Gorillas sound. You know, like no bells or whistles, just like. Here's kind of the elements of a gorilla song. Yeah, it's very dubby. It's kind of dark. It's got this uh, spooky vibe to it. Yeah, I think it's cool. I think it's a, I think it's a cool little uh, oddity. I mean, I think as a song, it's not something I go back to over and over again again because it is pretty simple and it is pretty mm-hmm. repetitive. Um, I do think it would have kind of worked better as an instrumental though, without the without the any of the vocals on it. Yeah, I think it would have been a cool little dubby companion to a, a track we're probably talking about later on, uh, film music. Maybe so, maybe so. Would have co- formed a cool little uh, trilogy of Gorillaz instrumentals from uh, Phase 1, you know, double bass, film music, and then we would have had this one. Well, Trevor, if you if you do pick up an aftermarket copy of MTV Music Generator 2, you can make an instrumental version. All the more reason to hunt one of those down. Yeah, get out your PlayStation 2 and make a Gorillaz album like Damon's going to do on the Humans Tour. Yeah, but first, why don't I give this uh, wheel another spin? <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. And the next rarity is... Feel Good Ink Noodles Demo. This one sounds kind of shitty, I should just say off the bat. Uh, Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's pretty fair to say. Um, and this showed up as a... This was one of the last songs uh, from Phase 2 that we got, I think, right? Yeah, uh, okay, so it was released in December of 2006 on the U.S. iTunes EP of Feel Good, Inc. The main difference in the arrangement of this song is that the they kind of brought that, that little string rise and fall that happens at the end of every two measures like way forward yeah way forward and they play it a little more i think right maybe so it's there in the album version but it's it's 
kind of it's more of a whisper and not album. as noticeable at all and i think the uh, acoustic guitar is probably a rougher take right sounds like it and there's also kind of like there's less what i guess i would call soundscape that kind of rounds out the mix of that part as well yeah and de la soul are uh, obviously not here yet you just get a copy paste of the of the rough draft lyrics version of a very rough draft i mean it is interesting that you can you can look at how much made it onto the album version versus what's on this version to kind of see da- a little look into damon's lyrics writing process um i'd say probably 40 percent of what's yeah. on this version made it onto the album version yeah his voice sounds very interesting here though it's much rougher it's very, and it's got a kind of high squeaky quality to it almost at times. Yeah, and I mean, it sounds like this demo is pretty far along by this point, right? Yeah, it's very, the song feels very fully planned out. It, it almost seems like everything that needed to be played on an instrument in the studio had been played. Like, so from right. here, you just needed Damon's final lyric and you needed Danger Mouse to, like, tweak the knobs and, and put everything in its place. Um, interesting document, not something I'm going to go back to very often, probably. Here's, here's the question, though. Why is this Noodles demo, whereas Don't Get Lost in Heaven, as it appears on D-Sides, is just an original demo? I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. Is it? Is it... Because Noodles, supposed, she wrote all of Demon Days, right? Isn't that in the lore? Right, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, I don't know. I'm not sure what to make of that either, Trevor. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. not, not a super ton to say about this one, though. No, me either. So let's give this wheel another spin. Hey! The next hey. Uh, song, Trevor, is... Film trailer music. One of the worst songs in the Gorillas canon. I think that this is the worst Gorillas song. But first, let me uh, go ahead and say that this was released in December of 2007 on the Japanese edition of D-Sides. Uh, it was intended to be used in an in a abandoned concept for a trailer for the documentary Bananas, um, which apparently was going to be a spoof of the Clockwork Orange trailer. Um, Interesting. Yeah. This sounds like kind of a phase two take on Phoner to Arizona to me. <laughs> it's just, it sounds like Damon kind of rolling his elbows along a keyboard. It does. And then kind good. of slamming on it a little bit. It does have a speed up, which I don't think exists anywhere yeah. else in the Gorillaz uh, catalog. And it's got that part. <laughs> do, you <think> that, <laughs> do you think that the reason that this trailer was scrapped is because the song is so bad? <laughs> <laughs> it's a possibility because it is a pretty bad song it's not, it's not really a song though i just why even release it that's like why even put it out Dude, i really the, don't understand the the mysterious world of the japanese edition bonus tracks is impenetrable to mortal man i don't understand who this is a bigger fuck you to though is it a bigger <laughs> fuck you to, to to japan like hey you know how you guys usually get some cool stuff Check this out. Right. Or is it a bigger fuck you to everybody outside of Japan <laughs> who's going to hunt down this track like a fucking crazy person? Right. Going, then, I need to have every this. gorilla song. Here's the one of the rarest ones. Film trailer music. Can't wait to listen to this. Like the holy grail of gorillas <laughs> rarities. And they get this. Sometimes you sometimes you you climb a mountain and then the view that you get is just like a wasteland of human sewage. Yeah. And that's what yeah, you got. This is the yeah. You climb a mountain and you find Kong Studios on fire. <laughs> Not a great song. Don't want to talk about it anymore, so let's give this wheel another spin. All right. Here we go. The next uh, rarity, Trevor. Oh, the next rarity is Gorillas on My Mind. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, from the Blade 2 soundtrack. Yes, this is a song uh, credited to Redman and Gorillas. Have you seen Blade 2? I have seen Blade 2. I think it's the best of the Blade movies. Can you tell me how this song features in the film? Mm, I think it's at a nightclub. Interesting. That's my that's my vague recollection of it. Because you know, all I can picture while I listen to it is just bl- like Wesley Snipes killing some vampires while Red Man and Gorillas perform in the background. If you want to pick this up, by the way, it is on the uh, Blade Two soundtrack, which was released in March of two thousand two. Uh, I think the worst thing about this song, Trevor, is the title. <laughs> Really? I hate I would say title. the worst thing about this song is the nonstop references to actual gorillas. Oh, I love it. I love it. Really? Yeah. Really? I think at the time I really dismissed That is the cardinal sin of gorillas collaboration to me. If you talk about actual gorillas. I think that in you're 2002 Redman was at such a peak of personal char- of charisma, you know, that like mm-hmm. he pulls it off for me. But okay. So I when this song came out, I I absolutely remember it we were kind of between phase one and two at the time and i really dismissed this as being like not a real gorilla song as being kind of like a cash in or something like that right 
I can't imagine why you would do that. You know, he's, he's name checking Megillah. Maybe that doesn't work for you. But like, what about when he goes? What about when he does shit like uh, uh, lights, camera, action, roll drums, and then he goes? Brrr. That's so fun. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Redman definitely does a good job on this track. I just I'm not a big fan of the lyrical content. Although I do um I do think uh, two things are interesting. Bobby One, Womack. we get a Bobby Womack shout out. Yes. Yep. Two, we get a Monica Lewinsky shout out. <laughs> yeah, you gotta love that Lewinsky <laughs> shout out, which in 2002 already was was maybe right? a little dusty. Right. The it's got a kid koala outro for some extra scratching. Mm-hmm. And the production I think is actually really cool. They like added some power chords to the to the the stop part of the beat to kind of give it a little bit more oomph, you know? Gives it a little bit of a ra- of a, like a rock rap vibe though at the same time, which I kind of doesn't pass the sniff test for me. This was like the going through these 30 songs over the last week, this was like one of the the biggest surprises to me, like how much I enjoyed this song. Cool, but for now let's uh let's spin the wheel and get on to the next track. The next song Trevor is Donkomatic. Dun, okay, dun, I dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. I've been wanting to talk to you about Donkomatic. <laughs> now, this was um, a, kind of like a non-album single that they released uh, a, relatively sh- shortly after Plastic Beach. Yeah, right? October this was still of 2010. 2010. October of yeah. 2010. Um, yeah, so a couple of months after it came out. And initially, it was actually issued under a different name. It was issued under the name Donkomatic, parentheses, all played out. All played out, yeah. At the time, this was a probably the lowest moment of like the fandom and how they felt about the project and the decisions that were being made behind the scenes at least yeah in my this opinion. was a very this was a very acerbically received song and if you go back which i don't necessarily recommend that you do but if you go back and look at the fan conversation surrounding this song at the time you're going to feel the difference in sensibility of 2010 sort of socially and politically than 2017 <laughs> It was a dark hour for the Gorillaz fandom. Boy, there, there's a lot of things being said about Daily in those early discussions that are cringingly homophobic. Uh, I don't I don't know what to say about that because I don't want to invalidate people who dislike Daily on the song as being homophobes, but a lot of the conversation around the song at the time was quite hateful and politically charged uh, in a way that, that really made me uncomfortable. Um, but then I will say interacting with the fan community now i really feel like this song's been reevaluated i whenever it comes out definitely i think in uh in light of humans the new sound we got with this album i think it casts this one into an entirely different light oh my gosh completely i mean for one you've got damon kind of playing this brief cameo role in it just doing the talk mm-hmm. to me talk to me it's got a whole dance vibe to it and then it's got all these references to personal technology and personal technological yeah, would have fit in completely like uh seamlessly into humans yes exactly um i will say that from day one i loved this song like i think this is one of the catchiest hooks uh on a gorilla song i think that i love the lyrics i love the close the white book and and do you think that that lyric is maybe why apple didn't uh officially sponsor the fall because they're like what why you guys why you guys no, dissing I on macbooks i don't i really don't I'd be very surprised if anybody Apple has heard this song. That's and true. if they have, I don't think they really picked out that kind of little subtweet that uh, Damon included here. What do you think about Don Matic, Trev? I think it's pretty cool. And you know what? Listening to it this week in preparation for this uh, episode, it really did grow on me. I like this song a lot better post-Humans. That's awesome. I will say, though, I don't like Daly on it. Oh, I love Daly on it. I, I, love, I love his voice. I think it's an emotional, powerful performance. See, I like singers who sing like Daly. He's kind of doing that, like, white dude, soulful, like, house R&B kind of thing. I on almost think he's more, he's more aping the, the, the Christina Aguilera's of the, of the world as kind of doing a, a, a yearning, you know, pop diva uh, performance. But, but go ahead, he, keep continue. Like, I don't know, I just think this song would have been a lot stronger if it maybe had, like, a vocal from, like, a Peeven Everett type or something like that. That makes sense. Obviously, this this single was kind of released as a way to save face commercially um, because all of the Plastic Beach singles had flopped. Um, right. And in that regard, it was a minor success. Like, it, it cracked the top 40 in UK, which is better than any Plastic Beach uh, single did. Obviously, I think a stumbling block for a lot of people are those those horns, what we've maybe affectionately... The come, Yeah, we've come to call the Donka horns. Uh, yeah. This is, their, this is their truly their shining moment. And yes, I agree that they're weird, um, but I think they work on this song. I think they give the song an interesting and unique vibe. 
I think pretty much everything on this song works. Even daily, he does do a serviceable job. I'd like to, I'd like to hear a different kind of something that feels, I don't know, maybe just more a bit legit. I think he does a good job on this song, though. Like I said, pretty much everything here works for me, and I really, really dig this one. Post humans, you want to get on to the next one? Yes, yeah, but that will. All right, here we go. The next rarity, Trevor, is broken demo. These are uh, this comes from a series of demos that Damon played on some kind of radio. Session yes. he so hosted it was a, or something. It was a BBC Radio One takeover that happened in January of 2009. Okay. Um, do you think that this happened? Pr- did this recording happen pre-studio? Was Damon already starting to use his iPad to to work on demos of his songs? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, nothing on Plastic Beach sounds very iPady, so I'm more inclined to believe it was something he picked up while on tour. Uh, behind that album it's interesting this is an interesting document at the time i remember when plastic beach came out being kind of shocked like sort of how little broken had changed from this demo it's very similar then listening to them side by side again i think that some really smart choices were made in the arrangement and in the finishing of this song um it sounded very polished up as well it did so the the version this version does not have the second verse in it um, right which I always like to look at when I know that a, that two verses were written with a lot of distance between them to see if they kind of like, do they pass the sniff test of feeling like they belong with the song? Right, uh, or is it clearly two writing sessions? And actually, I think that he did a really good job uh, matching matching styles of the two verses of Broken that we have. Um, mm-hmm. The hi-hats are really grating in this mix. Yeah, this one sounds really bad, I think. I can't really listen to it on headphones. Pretty much all of the melodic elements of the album version are there. It's just that the mm-hmm. arrangement's all totally different, you know? That's all I have to say about Broken Demo. Do you have any yeah, any, this, any mind-blowing no, revelations? Nothing nothing really much to talk about here, I think. Uh, other than that, it sounds like Broken, but bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, so let's uh, give the wheel another spin. Here we go. Okay, the next rarity. Oh, Trevor, I'm so excited to have a conversation with you uh, about a, a little song known as L'Amour est ton oiseau rebelle, Gorilla's Remix. I have, I have a question for you about this one. I have questions, too. Let's lay them out on the line. First, what the fuck is this? Okay, I have, que- I have answers to that question. All right. Uh, This song, Trevor, was uploaded in August of 2001 to MTV.com, and it was used to promote the 2001 MTV Video Music Awards. Uh, And if you do a little poking around on the Wayback Machine, the Internet Archive, you can see the original uh, page. And this was not the only remix of this song. There was a remix of La Moraste en Oiseau Rebelle by Timbaland, The Neptunes, Jermaine Dupri and P. Diddy. Did you look up any of those other ones? Could not find a single one of them, Trevor. Bummer. <laughs> You'd have to go to, like, uh, Neptune's Unofficial for that. To Hallelujah Diddy. Yeah. Contact the guys at Hallelujah Diddy to see if they have it. Uh, the reason that they used this was because the the 2001 MTV Video Music Awards were being held at the Metropolitan Opera House uh, in New York City. So the opera tie-in is why they grabbed this song from Carmen. Everything's starting to come together. I've seen a lot of real love uh, expressed for this remix within the Gorillaz fan community. I think it's. I think it kind of kicks ass. I, honestly, I don't know. I don't I know about that. I think it's pretty cool. It's like so dubby and spooky and just kind of haunting. Can I talk to you a little bit about this song, "The More Aston Wesley Rebel," and why it's important? Yeah, like the original from the opera? Yeah, from the opera. Um, okay. So, so Carmen was released in 1875, and La Mora Aston Oiseau is like one of the three best-known songs on it, and I think it's like the most telepathic of the songs. This, to me, feels like an early draft of what a radio pop diva song would sound like. Um, I can definitely get behind that, yeah. So, for the one thing that structurally it's so radio pop like it's got this verse that that builds tension which is all we get in this remix we don't get any of the chorus uh but then when the chorus hooks in it like switches from minor key to major key and like is the chorus uh is the chorus part that's like ba-dum, bum, 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 ba-dum, bum, bum, bum. exactly ba-dum. yeah okay yeah i i do wish that was present here that yeah. it might and, it and, might ruin the vibe of the song a little bit, like throw it off, but I don't know. And I like how in the in the verses, you know, it's just the diva singing the aria, but then the full company comes in for the for yeah. the 
So it sounds like a drop. It sounds like a bass drop, but like an mm-hmm. 1875 version of a bass drop. And then even the lyrics are like weirdly like you could totally hear some of these lyrics being written in like a, a 1980s like super dramatic pop song. Here, let me let me quote a couple of them to you. Uh, Love is a gypsy's child. It has never known the law. Couldn't okay. you hear that yeah. in like a in like a uh, you know Eternal Flame style eighties uh, yeah. pop song? You know, you know. I think I was first introduced to Carmen in an episode of uh, the old Nickelodeon cartoon Hey Arnold. Oh, where, uh, sh- you're talking about perform- this is Shelley Flynn's jam right now that you're talking yeah. about Hey Arnold on Hell the Monkeys. Yeah, there's an episode where uh, the uh, the his uh, him and his classmates all perform it as like a school musical. The, I think the main reason that I'm not crazy about this remix is that I really wish that it ha- used the hook. I wish that it used that hook. I understand why it doesn't, though. It would have thrown off the vibe, I think. Maybe so. It's got that, like you said, that little dubby delay to it. Um, I do like the, the that bass line that's very low in the mix uh, that kind of fits over top of the track during some of the some of the parts. And like, I like how sloppy the drum sample sounds with it. You know, I like, do like how sloppy the drum samples sound. It just I, there's not quite enough happening here for me. And now here's another question I have though. What does a Gorillaz remix even mean in 2001? I think it means Dan the Automator. That's all I could that's, think. That's, yeah, that's what my guess would be as well. Doesn't it feel like it was probably some of that, that kooky label slash company crib, quib pro quo shit? Like if you if you re- remix this track for our website, we'll give you a feature or something like that. You know, I definitely get that impression, yeah. Um, hey, um, by the way, we are going to review uh, Carmen once we uh, run out of stuff to talk <laughs> oh, about, no. right? Oh, no. Yeah, I guess we are. We're going to have yep. to, right? Yeah. But for now, let's uh, give the wheel another spin. Okay. All right, let's see what we oh, got. Oh, Trevor, Trevor, Trevor. The next rarity that we will be talking about today is none other than Gorilla's Routine uh, by Kid Koala. Right. I like this one a lot. Dude, I think that this song is a gem. Um, it is beautiful. Let's talk about this. So this was released in July of 2003 on a very rare CD. It, it was only uh, put out at, at live Kid Koala shows from his uh, new Phonia Must Fall book tour in 2003. Now, the, the prevailing uh, theory about this song, Trevor, was that it was some kind of a discarded uh, phase one b-side that we never heard that kid koala was scratching over right yeah it might the origins of this composition might trace back to the self-titled uh but this week that's what i would assume we had a little bit of original research on behalf of the world's greatest gorillas podcast hallelujah monkeys we reached out to kid koala himself yeah this was actually pretty cool i was surprised that he got back to us about this yes so so getting ready for this episode i was like i want to know the the truth because you see, Trevor, one of the lyrics in this uh, in this song references a lonely man, mm-hmm. uh, and from a an interview with with Dan the Automator, we know that Damon had recorded a song called "Lonely Man" for an unreleased Dan the Automator uh, project. So I reached out to Kid Koala and I asked, "Did Gorilla's routine come from a, a unused Gorilla session, or was it part of Dan's canceled album?" And he responded to me that it was from. Dan's album, Omakase. Now, let's talk about Omakase, because it's crazy. I don't know anything about it. Omakase was a finished album. It had a music video for one of its songs. It was mixed and mastered, album art locked. And then the company that was putting it out, MCA, uh, was bought out by Geffen Records. Geffen being a subsidiary of Universal. And they decided it was just too small potatoes to bother releasing. Label fuckery. Isn't that uh, infuriating, Trevor? That's, that really fucking sucks. And prepared to get prepared to get more pissed off, Trevor. Great, because the version of Lonely Man from that album was a duet between Damon Albarn and Most Deaf. Whoa, that we will never hear. Maybe, maybe it'll maybe it'll spring up on some dark corner of the internet. Well, someday. that's why that's why I was going to ask you, Trevor. How do you feel ethically? About us mobilizing our listeners here. To go look for it? Well, or... <laughs> Listen, Dan the Automator seems to be like a really sweet, cool guy. He's yeah. very he's very politically active. He tweets nonstop about the crazy political dystopia that we're all living in in 2017. Um, How could you not? And Omakase also, I would imagine, is maybe a slightly painful subject for Dan the Automator. 
because right. he put his heart and soul into it, and happen. then the yeah. label fucked him. So that's why I would like to ask you to be very gentle in tweeting at Dan the Automator, asking him if he'll upload this song to SoundCloud. Because Ooh, I th- do, you, do you think this is a good idea? I think it's fine. Here, okay. let me give you a sample version of this tweet. All right, Dan. So sad to have not been able to hear Omakase. Gorillaz fans would love to hear Lonely Man. Will you upload it to SoundCloud? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it'll work. Maybe it'll work. I think it'd be awesome to hear, though. Come on. A, a Damon Albarn most deaf song from 2003. That would be pretty sick. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Let's talk about what we do have in the form of, of Gorilla's routine, Trevor. Because it's still a pretty good thing to have. You can't ever quite tell what all here is original and what all is Kid Koala adding, you know? Right, yeah. It does sound like uh, Damon's vocals are kind of scratched onto the song. That's true. And the main groove of it, the synth line that is the main groove of it, the kind of weird computery blip thing. Yeah. I love it. I really love it. This, this... It's very aching and nostalgic. Very be- Like, very pretty. It almost feels like in the same kind of emotional category as a song like Slow Country. Like, it's got that kind of sweet, melancholy, relaxing vibe of, of uh, Slow Country. But then the, the moving on repetition reminds me of the coming on repetition in, in Clint Eastwood. So Yeah, definitely. That's a good parallel. It almost feels like it kind of reminds me of something maybe from uh, the Blur album Think Tank, too. For sure, and that would make sense, considering the, the era that this, uh, this is supposedly coming from. Yeah. This, I feel like a lot of Gorillaz fans have never listened to this song. This um, is definitely one of uh, the harder-to-find rarities that I think we're talking about. I definitely suggest you go check it out. It is pretty long, but I think it's, it's pretty compelling. Um, and there's that uh, there's that uh, vocal sample towards the end. Do you know uh, who's speaking during that speech that uh, Kid yeah, Koala throws think, on here? I think that's Martin Luther King, I believe. Oh, right, yeah. That guy. Really good chord progression. This song is just like a real treasure. I think, you know, hats off to Kid Koala for giving what little of it we have to us, you know? Yeah, way to go. And uh, and you know what? Fuck Geffen Records. That was Fuck some Geffen real Records. bullshit they pulled on us. All right, so next song? Yes. All right, let me spin this wheel. Oh, Trevor. <laughs> the next song is Mix 2. Okay, cool. Yeah, one of those little demos that, uh, one of those little demos you could find laying around Kong Studios early phase two. Yeah, this was uploaded, uh, to Kong Studios in January of 2005, um, and it could be accessed on Noodle's mini disc player. Okay, I was gonna ask if it was Noodle's or 2D's, because I think there was another one on 2D's, right? We'll talk about that, though. Yes, so this is a pure. Uh, dick around, right? This is like a big yeah. dick around. Uh, it feels like he must be using a lot of the same um, technology that he used to make Demo Crazy here, right? Yeah, it, uh, that's definitely what I thought of, yeah. It sounds like, almost like, sounds like it could be from the same sessions. You know what's interesting, though, is that the the drum computing here, the drum programming, is at times sounds even more sophisticated than some of his computing on the fall. <laughs> I really like these arrangements, actually. I love that kind of, almost what sounds like it could be supposed to be a guitar. That Yeah, it's got, it's got a really interesting arrangement. But can we talk about that hook? Yeah. Do you hear the DNA of, of a potential top 40 smash hit lurking in that it's hook? Very, it's very catchy. That's a very catchy hook. Like that, this almost sounds like it could have been a B side off of Bad or Dangerous or something. Like it's got such a, a Michael Jackson y vibe to it. I don't know, just that hook really comes together. It, it makes me wish that this had not been abandoned and had been kind of, you know. It has the makings for like a great song. I think I would have loved to seen this one in a more finished version show up on uh, D sides because it would have fit in so well among tons of those tracks. Agreed. And then it's also got, at least in verse two, we do have that funny part where he sort of clucks like a chicken. Yeah, there's some. He makes some weird. He makes some weird noises on this track. Yes, he does. Uh, yeah, I I don't think that there's a canonical uh, confirmed set of lyrics for this song, but if you look online, you can find some really funny guesses. Yeah, it's very. It's one of the harder uh, Damon performances to interpret, though. I think. But I mean, am I wrong? I'd love to hear some musically inclined Gorillaz fans take that hook and do something with it, and like make a make a cool 1991 era Michael Jackson smash hit out of it. You know, that'd be sick. Anybody who's listening, feel free. Yeah, man. Yeah, but uh, let's give the big wheel another spin. Oh, snap, because the next song that we're going to be talking about, oh, we're going to be talking about uh, Three Hearts, Seven Seas, Twelve Moons. Kind of a sister track to uh, Pirate's Progress. That's true. This was released in March of 2010 on the iTunes Deluxe Edition of Plastic Beach, not on the Japanese version of it. And Um, like Pirate's Progress, it is an extended orchestral piece that I assume was arranged entirely by Damon again. 
Yes, and I don't think this one's nearly as effective as Pirate's Progress. Um, no, it's just kind of a... It's a little... It's definitely the lesser of the two. I it, still like it a lot, though. It sounds like it could be, like, again, very Gershwin-esque. Doesn't it kind of feel like a like it's sort of regally restating one of the little moments from that Benny Goodman song, Sing, Sing, Sing? Because it's like... Ba-da, ba-da, ba 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 which sounds a lot like but it sounds a lot like that Benny Goodman uh, song to me. I didn't hear that, but now that you uh, pointed it out, I probably will always have to think of that. <laughs> Sorry, you know, whenever ha- you know, because I listen to Three Hearts, Seven Seas, Two Moons very frequently. <laughs> yes, all the time. Uh, yeah. This feels a little bit more like a style exercise to me than like a full warm complete composition the way that the sounds pirates. like a pretty good way to describe it style exercise yeah you know what i mean i mean symphonia yeah. viva is doing a great job obviously and i think wasn't this used for one of the plastic beach teaser videos wouldn't surprise me that sounds about right i think it, it's fine in that context too um yeah but yeah the the title was something i was thinking about trevor of of potentially being a tie-in to the story of plastic beach um right because uh what's his name most def's character was a. Uh, uh, what was it? Sun, Sun Kill Moon? Moon? Sun Moon Stars. <laughs> Sun Kill Moon, right, no. Right. Sun Moon Stars. No, not that. I think uh, Three Hearts referring to there being only three members of the band with hearts now. Seven Seas, meaning the the distance that they had to cross, and Twelve Moons, perhaps the length of time that it takes to get to Plastic Beach or to Point Nemo from the mainland. You're fired from the podcast. Why? I think that three hearts connection. Get out of here. What do you mean? Cyborg Doodle doesn't have a heart. You really think Damon would title a song after how many hearts are in the cartoon band? Well, maybe not, now that you put it yeah. that way. I mean, Murdoch was God back in phase two, but I really don't think Damon was that interested in having a cartoon representation of the band. I don't know. This seems like a tasteful statement of the lore, though. Like, the idea hey. of of this image of, of there being only three living souls left in the ba- band sort of traveling to the the island i don't know i like that take of it trevor well you know what radiohead says i might be wrong that's true <laughs> that's true but i'm probably the one who's wrong if i'm being honest <laughs> who knows let's get on to the next song though put that argument behind us and spin the wheel again oh snap the next uh, rarity trevor is i got law uh which is a blur song so maybe it shouldn't even be on here but whatever it definitely counts because it is the original demo for the song that would become Tomorrow Comes Today. Yes, and it was released in March of 1999. Uh, it was a Japanese bonus track on the deluxe edition of Blur's 13. Uh, Another bit of a maybe a fuck you to Japanese fans or Blur fans located outside <laughs> of Japan. So. Imagine, though, I this is something I kept thinking about when I was listening to this in preparation for the episode. Imagine being a Blur super fan who tracks down all these songs. And getting the Japanese edition of uh, 13 and getting this weird little demo like that, you know, you can't imagine anything ever coming from. Well, at least, he got like, that, at least they got that great lyric, President, he just got hair down below. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but imagine being a Blur super fan, hearing this song in 1999, and then two years later, it's a gorilla single. Right, yeah, that is crazy, and it, and it is, I mean, definitely the vibe could not be more different from the vibe of no. Tomorrow Comes Today. Here it's some kind of weird PCP'd out, like, suitcase synthesizer jam. But isn't it weird that, like, in 1999, Damon Albarn was already starting to experiment with, like, synth pop and synth arrangements? And... Right, well, I mean, 13 was a big uh, step into the more, like, electronic experimental direction for him, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. I would love mm-hmm. to know what kind of drum computer Damon was using for his touring demos back there. I bet you some crazy super nerd listener of ours knows. The drums here are so much more aggressive than On Tomorrow Comes Today. He's he's doing a lot of snare fills, like... We just talked about we just talked about Mix 2. I think that this song has, like, a very similar vibe to Mix 2. Yeah, Damon apparently loves getting on some pads and fucking it up. Right? Not much else to say about it. It is interesting to think that Tomorrow Comes Today, that sort of that that atmospheric melancholic song grew out of this weird uh yeah it's oddity. interesting how there is a like an official gorillas kind of related song released under the blur name none of that on your own nonsense no 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 but let's uh spin the wheel because i think we're done here up next we've got we've got a, an interesting one here trevor okay uh we've got soldier boy right this one kind of surprised me when it first came on in the mix I made of these songs in preparation for this one. I was like, oh, God, what is this? And then I checked and I was like, oh, this one. This is cool. So this was released in May of 2008. Uh, it was it was a B-side on the EP of a single called Poison uh, by Martina Topley Bird. And this is mm-hmm. a Martina Topley Bird 
song. Right, yeah, Feet Gorillas. Uh, Feet Gorillas. And so it grew out of a out of an abandoned uh, phase two song called Snakes and Ladders. Such a cool track name. And it was going to have a pretty cool Damon hook, too, I think, right? With him going like snakes, snakes and, and ladders, ladders, snakes, snakes and, and ladders. ladders. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, you can see that in Bananas, I think, right? Uh, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's in the movie. I think it was part of the supplemental, like, deleted scenes or something like oh, okay. that. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that would have been cool. But so, this song is pretty, I, I like what we got here. It makes so for a good Martina have, Poppy word song. We don't have, there's a bass line in Snakes and Ladders that's not present here. In fact, there's no bass line on the song at all, which I think is kind of a shame. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a bummer. There's a really cool bass line in Snakes and Ladders, and I bet an enterprising artistic listener could could sneak on a little synth bass line that would sound a lot like that, and it would probably improve the song a bit. Uh, but some of that we know is definitely from those Demon Day sessions. Like, the, the actual electric guitar bit that kind of drives the song, we can't hear that in the snippet that we do have of Snakes and Ladders, but... The tone of the guitar that is on Snakes and Ladders is identical to the tone of this guitar. So clearly this was from that same session. It's um, a sick guitar tone, too. I really love the guitar on this track. Agreed. And that Rich Maneuver verse is kind of monster, dude. Like It's that. great. Who put the chemicals in the food chain? And how about, how about the lyric leading into that, which is like, uh, false food, phosphate, who's to blame? That's so cool. He's great. I really like Roots Maneuva. Me I'm too. excited to talk about his stuff a little more in depth later on in the show. I love the really the really assaulting outro where it's just like everything kind of like explodes at the end. And I also really like Martina's intro where she does like a fa- like a false take at the beginning, you know? She goes, like, yeah. if our time was right, ooh, and then does another one. <laughs> It would be really cool to get some actual gorilla songs that sound like this, I think. Just like a really kick-ass band. And of course, that uh, uh, Roots Manuvik lyric about chemicals in the food chain, that would be kind of uh, mixed into uh, intro from Demon Days. That's right. And and another cool choice on this Martina version is that she doubles up on Roots during his verse. Like, she kind of sing-raps the same lyrics that he's rapping behind him. So it's I fun. like that effect, yeah. Yeah, I think if you threw the Snakes and Ladders bass line onto this... Uh, it would improve it immensely. I don't. I, as much as I like that snakes and ladders hook, I don't know if this song is like aching for it. It does feel kind of complete with the two of them on it, you know. Yeah, it feels like they took it in another direction and they finished it that way. All right, so going through uh, these rarities is um, has I'm I'm a little exhausted, so I think I'm going to give the wheel one more spin and then we'll call it a day for the episode. Okay, we got one more rarity for today. All right, here we're, let's let's see let's see what note we're ending on. And the final rare. Oh well, this is weird. The final rarity, Trevor, is. Something Like This Night by Snoop Dogg. The other featuring Gorillaz song. <laughs> featuring Gorillaz. We've done two in yeah. a row. That's kind of weird, right? Yeah. Um, this was uh, released in March of 2011 on the album Dogumentary. Uh, Dogumentary. We know for sure that this is a, a leftover of the Plastic Beach Sessions. Um, here's an interesting credit. Here's an interesting credit, Trevor. Guess who's credited in playing live drums on this song? Who's credited playing live drums on this song? Tony Allen. Wow. Little, uh, almost like a little uh, Good, the Bad, and the Queen hook up there. How cool is that, right? And, uh, yeah. and Steve Sedgwick and, and, and uh, Cox both have credits on this, too. So we definitely know that it's, uh, it's from the Plastic Beast Sessions. And even if we didn't, we have this great Snoop Dogg quote about the song uh, that I think will really enhance your appreciation of the song, Trevor. Hit me with that. He said... We did that record in London, England at their studio. The track made me want to sing and have fun and whatnot. I don't give a fuck. It's like, maybe I can smoke with you. Maybe I can't. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I do. I know exactly what he's saying. <laughs> I will say that his, his reggae man Snoop Lion intro feels a little bit embarrassing in the cold, sober daylight of 2017. <laughs> Remember when he was Snoop Lion for a minute there? I sure do. I sure do. You like Snoop Dogg? You like Snoop Dogg? I like Snoop Dogg. For sure. I think, uh, I think it's I think, great. I think that, that his his first solo album is amazing, and obviously his work on The Chronic. Doggy Style's a classic. His work on The Chronic and his work on The Chronic 2001 are both uh, uh, really terrific, and he's, he's, he's got like spots throughout his career where I think he was uh, really on top of his game. I think that this album is not one of those spots, and... yeah. This era in general isn't necessarily like a, a highlight era for, for Snoop. Um, this is a fun little track, though. I think the best line he gets out on this one is, The life I live is incredible. These trees I breathe are medical. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, do, I wish this one had kind of a stronger hook, though. Well, you know, I feel like you can hear Damon in the first line of that hook. Uh, just Yeah, the, definitely a little bit. His voice is somewhere in the mix. At the very beginning, the if you never tried it line, and then it, and then somebody else takes over for him. This almost sounds... Here's what I think this song sounds like to me, Trevor. It sounds like what Snoop 
imagined a collaboration between him and Gorillaz would sound like in his head, you know? I think this uh, sounds a little closer to what people may have expected the um, Snoop Dogg collab on Plastic Beach to sound like in the first oh, place before we definitely. actually got that song. I know this is kind of like what I was expecting it to sound like. It's got those donkomatic horns. It does, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing kind of a reggae thing here almost. Yeah, the, well, which which maybe again, maybe that was like a little harbinger of what was to come. So because this is weird and none of these songs are really connected and we can't really give this a piece of punctuation, uh, let's just say what our what our pick of the bunches and what our least favorite of the bunches. How about that? Yeah, so uh, I think what I really took away from... Uh the uh my listening sessions in terms of what we talked about this episode i really liked dub dumb that one stuck out to me a lot again that carmen remix really surprised by how taken i was with that one revisiting these tracks that's cool and the big one was donkomatic which took on a whole new life for me uh post humans uh for me donkomatic if it had been on plastic beach would have been top three on plastic beach for me that's how much i love this song and it's uh and it's one of it's in like the top five gorilla singles for me so i've always been on wow. Team Donkomatic, uh, for sure. And uh, and then beyond that, Gorilla's Routine, I think, is is a really magical Phase 1 era feeling uh, thing that I that I hope more of you will go out and listen to. Really nice. Do you want to talk about the ones where uh, we kind of revisited them and we're like, what the, what the fuck is this? Yeah, okay. So for me, the broken demo I find very difficult to get through because of that mix. Uh, yeah. Obviously, film the, trailer music was is another one that's just like, why does this exist? I think that that's the worst Gorillaz song or the worst release song with Gorillaz as a, as a, as the credited artist. Um, but hey, maybe maybe we got some film trailer music fans out there. Trevor. Yeah, maybe we'll hear from them. Get some hate mail. What do you guys think? Do you think that f- that film trailer music is the undiscovered gem of the Gorillaz catalog? Then certainly we want to hear from you. Reach out to us. You can email us at hallelujahmonkeys at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Tumblr. That, of course, is hallelujahmonkeys.tumblr.com or on facebook.com slash hallelujahmonkeys or on Twitter at Gorillas Fancast. Once again, please uh, send us your song and album rankings so that we can include you on our upcoming Power Rankings episode. Let us know also what you think about those two new alternate versions. Maybe maybe you think we didn't give those a fair shake. Maybe there's some super fans of the drum special, Trevor. Yeah, maybe they just completely made the album totally click for you once you uh, heard this drum verse that got cut. Yeah, maybe you'll do a Trevor Ickrath version of where you resequence humans and you drop the album versions and put the fire Yunnan and drum specials in, in their place. Maybe you're that person. So that ends uh, part one of our of our rarities retrospective rarities roulette uh next uh next week we'll get to uh the second half but until then don't would you maybe say that we're uh all played out for now <laughs> yeah we're all played out played out all played, played out. out see you next week thanks for talking to me Something like this night. 40 people you would like